Okay, so I will try to get through this as quickly as I can. These things are sort of disparate topics. Um, it's like slice of the pie no one wants to eat, except maybe the last one. Um, these are my disclosures. So uh, we'll start with the pie, uh, because I think the pie will help us uh, to contextualize the four different targets that I'll be talking about today, which are KRAS uh, at 25%, um, HER2 and BRAF at around 3 to 4% of patients, and then uh, MET uh, alterations that happen in about 4% of patients, depending on how you characterize them. And I think uh, before we launch into a discussion about the data, and unfortunately because a lot of the stuff is not as mature as EGFR and ALK, we're going to have to delve into some of the preclinical concepts. Uh, it's worth mentioning that a lot of these things have um, approved agents that you can use off-label. So for HER2 mutant lung cancer, one can always consider any of the number of different HER2 directed therapies that are approved for breast cancer, for uh, BRAF mutant lung cancer, vemurafenib, uh, with or without trametinib, um, for MET, exome 14 splice variants, and amplified patients, crizotinib, um, and for the other things that are listed there, again, a number of things that have been approved in other malignancies that can be considered uh, for our patients off trial. Uh, so HER2, I think that the first thing I want to mention is that HER2 aberrant disease, it's not a homogeneous uh, group of patients. HER2 mutations, HER2 amplification, HER2 protein overexpression, we've learned are distinct targets. Um, and so we have to be careful about what we mean when we say HER2 positive lung cancer. Um, and so, again, this notion of amplification mutation and protein overexpression, there's a little bit of overlap for all three or two out of the three, but mostly these things tend to be siloed um, in terms of the patients that they arise in, uh, and the responses that we've seen uh, to HER2-directed therapy have also been different. So this is a good review article um, from JTO uh, last year showing uh, all of the trastuzumab lung cancer trials that have been uh, performed largely in patients who were HER2 protein overexpressed, focusing on the 2 plus, 3 plus group of patients. Uh, again, all of these trials treated patients with trastuzumab. Most of these were single arm studies of either trastuzumab by itself or coupled with some kind of chemotherapy. Um, one of them was a randomized uh, phase two trial of chemo with or without um, trastuzumab. And I think a couple of take-home points in terms of the response data, which are shown here, and I pile that in green, is that single-agent trastuzumab has very little activity, which perhaps is not surprising. Single-agent HER2-directed therapy in breast cancer also has uh, not so much activity, but it's really in combination that you see synergy arise. Uh, so we can more or less say that all of the trials were negative. The single-arm studies were really no better than you would expect from historical chemotherapy. And for the randomized uh, trial that Gatzmeyer had published um, uh, quite a while ago now, there was no difference in terms of cisgem versus cisgem plus trastuzumab uh, for survival response uh, or progression-free survival. Uh, there was a signal that was seen in very, very high overexpressed uh, uh, HER2 patients as well as FISH amplified, where there were five out of six responses. This is sort of continued as a, a, a potential target in uh, protein overexpressed patients. So HER2 mutations have been a more recent target. These happen in 2 to 4% of lung cancers and happen, though at least the ones that we're interested in, are in the coding sequence for the kinase domain. The most common HER2 mutation occurs in exon 20 um, as an, and is a insertion, a 12 base pair insertion that encodes for YVMA. So from this point on, I'll refer to it as YVMA, although there are nine base pair insertions also, which are relatively uh, common as well as point mutations. Uh, they tend to be more common in women and in never smokers, and we know from preclinical data that they are activating and transforming. This is uh, isogenic systems in which YVMA was introduced with uh, increased growth rate. And then on the right side, uh, orthotopic models, you can see uh, here that YVMA generated a tumor spontaneously, but the HER2 wild type did not. And we know that these are also responsive to HER2-directed therapies, lapatinib, trastuzumab, and uh, the combination also. And so uh, this year, uh, Mark Christ had published <clears throat> the experience with uh, dacomitinib in a phase two trial for HER2 mutant and amplified patients. These were largely HER2 mutant patients in the blue, uh, a few patients who were amplified in the red. The overall response rate in the mutant population was 12%, so this was this modest activity, none in the amplified uh, group, and there were three durable responses that were seen. And so I've listed what the three durable responses are, and, and uh, interestingly, there are no YVMA uh, mutations who had uh, responded. The responders were actually nine base pair insertion patients, and then this insertion deletion of WL 
V. And I think uh, there are two take home points to this. One is that there's some heterogeneity in the genetics uh, that are underlying, the genotypes that are underlying this response, which makes things a little bit messy. But the other thing is that these responders are real responders. The, as you saw in the waterfall plot, uh, there was quite a bit of shrinkage, and the duration of response is actually quite long uh, for these patients. So clearly, it's a very good signal. This is not sort of activity that goes away in two months uh, that's there for us to untangle. Uh, so niratinib and niratinib with or without temsorolimus uh, were also studied in phase one and phase two trials um, in HER2 mutant lung cancer, initially uh, presented by Lena Gandhi um, and published in JCO in 2011. The response rate to niratinib is a, a resounding 0%, but when you add temsorolimus to niratinib based on some preclinical da data that they had, you get a response rate of 21%, which is not that bad. So uh, two of the three responders in this trial had YVMA, uh, insertions, which is different from uh, dacamitinib. Um, and the other way to say it is that there's a 50% response rate if you were one of the four patients who had a YVMA insertion. And this is, sort of, again, the genotypes that we're seeing here. And these salmon-colored ones are partial responders. Um, again, two out of the three were YVMA, one was a GSP. Um, and so it's safe to say that there is a signal that's there. Uh, in terms of HER2 mutant lung cancer, we really don't know what that signal is though, because of the really the heterogeneity in the genotypes. And so uh, Bob Lee uh, at Memorial, um, in conjunction with the phase one group, uh, is going to open up, or will soon open up, a basket study of TDM1, it's adotrastuzumab emtanzine, in uh, patients with amplified mutant overexpressed uh, HER2 lung cancer and a number of other solid tumor malignancies. The idea is that there will be uh, pretty methodical genotyping these patients, including protein expression, next gen sequencing, uh, with the hope that we'll be able to figure out exactly what the specific signals are that modify for response for this disease group. Um, so we're gonna shift over to the RAS, uh, RAF pathway now, and we'll start with the easiest one, which is BRAF, mutant lung cancer. And it always helps to start with a very basic outline of what the signaling pathway is, because it's gonna uh, be a recurrent thing for this one, as also for KRAS, mutant lung cancer. Uh, so it begins with uh, uh, RTK, uh, ligand binding, dimerization, phosphorylation, uh, which then recruits RAS to the membrane, where guanine exchange factors can activate it, leading to downstream signaling through BRAF, and then uh, the MAP kinase pathway. And so the way uh, the V600E mutation works is that it creates a functional RAF monomer. Uh, RAF requires dimerization in order to function, but the V600E mutation creates a functional monomer, which is important because it's, constitu uh, sorry, it's constitutively active and so is independent of any kind of RTK signaling or any kind of uh, upstream RAS uh, signaling. Um, and we know that it is sensitive to V600E specific inhibitors. This is Vemirafinib data uh, published by David Hyman uh, from the phase one group at Memorial. We had a bunch of non-small cell lung cancer patients uh, who were enrolled on the study, and the response rate was pretty good at 42% with a median PFS of uh, 7.3 months. Uh, Dibrafinib has also been studied in this setting uh, with a response rate as a single agent of 32%. Uh, so, the results are great, but they're not sort of Tarsiva, each of our mutant lung cancer, or Fatinib, each of our mutant lung cancer, great, or even, you know, or Alk lung cancer, great. So clearly, there's something that we're missing. And so a lot of uh, basic science work has been done over the past five years to really tease apart why this is the case in melanoma and in lung cancer. And I think the, the, the biggest uh, discovery for me and the most important one was out of Neil Rosen's lab, Pirolito, when he was a a uh, postdoc there, published in Cancer Cell now a few years ago. Essentially what ends up happening is that when you have, as I had said before, BRAF v V600E, you get constitutive activation of MAP kinase pathway. Uh, and then uh, what ends up happening is that ERK uh, has fe negative feedback regulation of the receptor tyrosine kinase. So it essentially shuts down uh, any kind of downstream signaling from RTKs. And this is why it's an RTK independent, RAS independent state. When you inhibit BRAF V600E though, you shut down downstream ERK signaling, which relieves the negative feedback loop so RTK signaling can start, uh, uh, can progress uh, yet again. And it it's, uh, does this through RAS and the recruitment of alternative RAF isoforms such as CRAF, uh, which then leads to uh, some degree of, uh, again, MAP kinase signaling downstream. So a bypass pathway that occurs in the same pathway, uh, but essentially bypasses suppression of BRAF. So depending on when this steady state gets set up, 
very early on, if it gets set up very early on, then you'll have primary resistance. If it takes a while for this steady state to occur, then you'll have a period of response and control before you end up getting resistance. And so this paradigm, this modeling paradigm was used um, in melanoma, now this is recently FDA approved, but also in lung cancer, using both BRAF E600E inhibition as well as MEK, uh, downstream MEK inhibition. Uh, in this case, a phase two study, which is ongoing of dabrafenib plus trametinib in lung cancer. Again, as a frame of reference, single agent dabrafenib response rate is 32%. When you put the two together, you get 63%, which is pretty great. Um, and again, this study is ongoing and um, has received FDA approval for melanoma. So in summary, for V600E BRAF mutant cases, uh, it, it's a tractable um, a target. Dabrafenib received breakthrough designation, not approval, in 2014. The combination breakthrough designation uh, this year uh, also, so very promising things for V600E mutant uh, lung cancer. And again, you can provide off-label treatment with vemurafenib uh, for these patients uh, off study. So targeting KRAS uh, is the penultimate thing that I'll talk about. Uh, again, this is the signaling pathway. Um, and there have been two general therapeutic strategies to targeting uh, KRAS mutant lung cancer. One has to do with inhibition of downstream signaling. MEK ERK inhibition, and the other more recent is inhibition of KRAS itself, either through uh, guanine exchange factor inhibition, as we'll see later on, or allosteric kinase pocket inhibition, so these competitive inhibition that we're used to for other small molecules. So I'm going to focus now on the efforts for downstream MAP kinase uh, inhibition, which in the first that was presented um, uh, was uh, published by uh, Passiani in Lesson Oncology now a couple of years ago, presented earlier than that, which was a randomized trial of selimitinib plus docetaxel versus docetaxel by itself in KRAS mutant lung cancer patients. And the data were relatively striking. The response rate was about 37%, sorry. Um, in the uh, combination group, the response rate is actually quite low, although sort of if you just extended these lines, uh, uh, you'd get uh, maybe a similar response rate. Uh, but the PFS was better, oh, I keep doing this, um, and the overall survival data were better also. This is very promising for a disease which had had no targeted therapy uh, before. So uh, George Blumenshine had also published this year the trametinib single agent experience in this disease um, versus docetaxel, and the response rate was 12% for trametinib. It was also 12% for docetaxel, so uh, really no different, although, again, uh, there is modest activity as a single agent uh, for MEK inhibition that's present. Uh, there was an interesting... Um, uh, ASCO uh, presentation by David Gandera a couple of years ago, uh, taking a look at trametinib plus docetaxel in KRAS mutant lung cancer patients with a response rate of 28%, but they also took a look at KRAS wild type patients where the response rate was also 32%. Uh, and this was uh, some uh, initial data suggesting that maybe the KRAS uh, mutant component may not be so important. Maybe it is sort of uh, a combination therapy that might work for additional patients uh, also. Um, and then the, the final component to this was that Paziani had just published this year some additional data from the settlement and experience now taking a look at different uh, KRAS mutations with the suggestion, this is just the overall response rate at 37%, with the suggestion maybe G12Vs responded better, maybe G12Cs responded better, which was significantly different uh, than uh, here if you put them together than if you did not. So again, maybe some difference in terms of the specific kind of KRAS mutation that you had. And there's been a fair amount of data in taking a look at this, natural histories of different mutations, uh, differences in response to chemotherapy and things like that. So maybe the most interesting uh, component uh, to this talk, at least uh, for me, is the work that's been done to try to specifically target KRAS. Uh, and I think the most mature right now are these allosteric kinase pocket inhibitions. And one, so the, the reason why it's been so difficult, one of the reasons is that uh, RAS uh, isoforms have exceptionally uh, low um, uh, uh, IC50s, or very, very uh, high affinity for GTP and GDP. It makes uh, competitive inhibition through medicinal chemistry, very difficult uh, to, to do. Um, the way, of course, this ends up working in terms of RAS mutations, uh, causing constitutive activation is that impairs hydrolysis of GTP, keeping it in an on state. Uh, there was a um, manuscript published by Osterman colleagues in Nature a couple years ago who had designed a novel compound that binds specifically to the cysteine residue in KRAS G12C. So it's taking advantage of this amino acid substitution that's occurred. And the way this ends up working is that when you have uh, GTP bound, it essentially, um, in terms of the protein conformation, 
uh, keeps it stuck in this loaded spring arrangement. There are these two uh, components of the protein called switch one and switch two, which are locked in position. Uh, once GTP gets hydrolyzed, these uh, switches end up getting relieved, which helps uh, GDP to uh, come off and for GTP to come on as well. And it's at this point that the compound can end up binding when it's in this relaxed, uh, inactive position, again, taking advantage of the cysteine residue that's there uh, in order to keep it in an off uh, state. And so, um, uh, so they've uh, done some preclinical work to show that uh, it, this does work in a number of KRAS G12C mutant cell lines in terms of the IC50s for cell viability, which are very, very uh, low in terms of nanomolar of potency, uh, and then induction of apoptosis in a couple of these cell lines here, which were not present in these non-G12C mutations uh, also. So some initial data, I think, that's promising for targeting uh, RAS also, finally. The last thing I'm going to talk about uh, is uh, targeting MET, and we'll go through this relatively quickly. Um, so again, just like for HER2 mutant lung cancer, MET aberrant disease is not a homogeneous entity. We know mutations and amplification and overexpression are different targets, and unlike for HER2, there's probably a fair degree of overlap for at least two out of these um, three entities, which has made, I think, uh, some earlier work, particularly with protein expression and MET-MAP, a little bit difficult to, to tease apart, but, uh, but uh, some of the newer data may provide some explanations for why we've seen some discrepant uh, clinical data. So MET-IHC, uh, we know just by itself does not predict for response to MET inhibition. Uh, this from um, the MET-MAB trial, which was a randomized phase three study in the second line setting of Erlotinib with or without uh, onartuzumab presented by David Spiegel. Uh, they took a look at uh, high uh, met expressors, and unfortunately, the data were negative. The survival was not significantly different, PFS not different, response rate not different, although interestingly, there was a trend towards uh, improved overall survival favoring or nortuzumab. This was very surprising because the phase two data were positive uh, that preceded this, although again, I point to the fact that there was a trend towards improvement in survival for onartuzumab. Um, Met amplification uh, has been looked at specifically with crizotinib in the ongoing phase one uh, study uh, of the agent, uh, which has a met amplified arm data presented by Ross Kamage last year, um, where they took uh, different strata of met amplification and took a look at response. And they did see responders, four partial responses presented last year, updated with additional ones uh, since then. But most of these happen in the high amplified group. And so the thought is that you need very high levels of amplification uh, potentially uh, to see responses. This study uh, is ongoing. I'm sure we'll hear an update at ASCO uh, next year for, for how they're doing also. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is work that we ended up doing, uh, identifying MEDX on 14 spy site mutations as responsive to MET inhibition also. It's a new class of um, sort of oncogenic target that has not to do with mutations that lead by itself to constitutive activation of the receptor, but rather to alternative splicing. So there are uh, splice acceptor and donor sites that flank exon 14 that can be mutated or deleted, which then ultimately ends up deleting exon 14. And when this happens, you get loss of turnover of the protein. Exon 14 is required for ubiquitination. So again, when this gets deleted, you no longer get a turnover of the MET protein. So MET stabilizes, and it's in this way as it overaccumulates that it becomes oncogenic. This was previously reported as oncogenic uh, back in 2006, actually, by Kong Beltran and colleagues. And it's not a new mutation. Ravi Salgia had characterized this in small cell lung cancer back in 2002, 2003. And I think it was an even earlier report, even a decade before that, that had found, uh, found this. Uh, these mutations occur in 4% of lung adenocarcinomas, maybe about a third of uh, sarcomatoid carcinomas uh, as a subset also. Uh, and these are uh, frequency data from our own group of patients, 678 non-squamous patients we sequenced uh, over the past year, uh, where we see a solid 4% of uh, metaxon 14 mutations amongst the other things that we've uh, detected. And this is a good sort of graphical repetition of the kind of mutations you see. You either see, you can see uh, point mutations in the specific acceptor and donor sites that are present. You can see deletions of portions of the exon, but also intronic sequence. And you can also uh, see deletions or mutations of uh, the um, uh, uh, tyrosine 1003 residue, which is the key um, component to binding to Sybil as part of the ubiquitin complex. Uh, we went on to show that all of these things are very high expressors of met protein expression uh, with H cores of 300, which is what you would expect based on mechanism, and that in fact exon 14 is deleted. This is uh, PCR 
uh, in these uh, patient samples for exon 14 normalized against exon 3 and 4. In met type patients, you see it's zero, which you would expect, but in these uh, mutant patients, uh, it's quite low. Cell line here for control. Um, and so uh, we had treated uh, a fair number of patients, uh, and the list has grown, but I've shown this from, the, from our uh, earlier mans manuscript. Uh, patients we treated with crizotinib, uh, who had par all partial responses uh, to therapy with a variety of different exon 14 uh, alterations that, that are present. Um, and this is an example of uh, just some of the responses that we've seen uh, in the lung, for instance, one patient who was treated with crizotinib after six weeks. Another patient, uh, or the same patient who had a response in the liver metastasis, quite robust. For me, the most interesting patient is one that we presented at World Lung, who was on uh, Alex's trial of cabozantinib uh, for about uh, six months um, with a uh, persist complete response, but not a resist response. So the tumor didn't actually shrink. Uh, they then progressed, and we put them on off-label crizotinib, and we got a dramatic resist response now in their liver metastasis, uh, which is ongoing. So very interesting in terms of what the dynamics are for differences in met inhibitors, potentially, why this might be the case is uh, a good source, uh, is going to be a very interesting thing to follow, and mechanisms of resistance, of course, everyone's going to look into as well. And that's it. <laughs>